Well, thank you for asking us to come and talk to you about Ready, Set, Go. It's a very important program for our department and for this community because you do live in a wildland uh, urban interface. Um, you're all familiar with wildfires, yes? Been through a few? Okay. Um, you all done your brush clearance? Okay, <laughs> step in the right direction. Um, I do have uh, the firefighters, uh, they've had a very, very busy day and uh, they were gonna try to make it over here. Just in case there were any questions specific to brush clearance or anything technical that they might be able to answer a little bit better than I can. Um, but I do have some information that I can give to you about the Ready, Set, Go program. Um, how many of you evacuate when there are evacuation orders? Oh, good, okay. Um, are you all prepared? Or do you think you could be better prepared? Better prepared. Okay, so brush clearance is the first step in preparing and creating that defensible space so that firefighters can better protect your homes. But there is also another element that goes along with that brush clearance, and that is to harden your home. It's a term we call hardening your home, um, which is to say that we want to look for ways to prevent embers from intruding and getting into the house, because that, that's a lot of times what causes those fires, the homes to catch fire, is the embers that are flying ahead of the fire. And sometimes those embers can travel half mile, one mile, uh, depending on how strong the winds are. So we want to make sure that we, ha we have maybe ember resistant vents installed so that the embers can't get in, that our, uh, the gutters on the roof are cleared out. We just want to make sure that there's nothing that can, that can have some ember intrusion to catch your home on fire. Um, I do have Captain Rossi. Do you want to come up and say hello? <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> and they are recording this. Um, okay. So uh, does anybody have any questions of a technical nature regarding brush clearance or? Yes. Because while we have them here, it's been very busy for them, so. Judy Talour. I have a slope down the back. I have a huge amount of property that I really don't need. And my slope is cleared and planted. Down below is cleared, as is the house here, as is the one here. All the rest of them up the hill are all wild. Um, I have friends that live over in the Saugus area and they say that they get notified by the fire department every year that they have 30 days to get their brush cleared. How come don't we get that on Nadell Street? That's, that's 128's area. That's 128's area? So they would have to be, you would have to go to the station on Plum Canyon, that's their area? and talk to the captain there to find out, because without knowing the area, I, I really don't know exactly what, why they wouldn't be requiring brush clearance in your area. Um, in this handout that you have, it will show exactly where it needs to be cleared and how it needs to be cleared. Um, so maybe you could pass this on to your neighbor. <laughs> I've lived there for 40 years and nobody's ever done anything. Is it, is it a common area or is it, is it their property? And it's the same street as yours, or is it an, an adjoining street? Nadell. Yeah. It's the same street? I was on that fire, and uh, that was a vicious fire. Happy Yeah. Um, but I would go, I mean, if you're concerned, do you know your neighbors very well, or are, they, are you amicable with them, or? I, they, they would probably figure I was asking them to spend money, but they didn't want to spend Okay. Well, what, what we should do then is have the local station, which is 128, come to your residence and just show them, hey, I am just have a question, why is this situation occurring, and see if they can address it. That would, that would be my, my uh, advice at this point. Or Judy, you can email me your address, um, 
and then the the addresses of, of the neighbors and I can also follow up with the station as well. Okay. So I'll check the deck list. I was doing a lot of the uh, business and brush inspections there. Obviously, Santa Clarita has gone through a lot of changes over the last decade. There's a lot of new home construction, that kind of stuff. So it could be an oversight, but for whatever reason, there's some, uh, even on the same street, some, some houses that because of uh, topography, wind, uh, positioning, may have gotten left off the deck list in years past. So it, if you don't bring it to our attention, it's really hard for us to update it because there's so much construction going on. So as Pat Rossi said, I, I encourage you to go to the station, explain what you just said, and then just try to get that rectified. Yeah, and that's and that that that's what I was. That's why I wanted your address because that what what he's referring to the deck list when he refers to that it's a it's a list of declared properties and those properties that are declared and approved by the board of supervisors to fall within brush inspections and for whatever reason, especially with a, a community like Santa Clarita that has just grown exponentially. Um, every year we find that we need to add properties to that deck list. Um, so th that list just keeps growing. So, But if those properties are never brought to our attention, then they never get added. And if they're not on that list, they don't, they're not subject to inspection. So we just need to make sure that they get onto that list if, if that's what's necessary. Um, okay, are there any other very specific questions. And I ask this just because it's very, very common that they could just get a call and have to take off. So while, <laughs> while we have them here, because I can cover all the rest of it, uh, but while we have them here, it's a great opportunity to take, take advantage of them. Uh, could you be more specific about what uh, ember resistant vents are? It's a, it's a mesh covering that gets inserted inside the vent that will prevent the embers from going in. Because, you know, the vent opening, anything can just kind of go through that opening. And this is a mesh that gets set behind that vent. It's like so a screen. That, it's like a yeah. fine screen. What about the other vents? Uh, stove vents? Um, they, they don't... They, you mean like an exhaust vent? Well, you have a... Yeah. Ex yeah. yeah. Typically, no, because it's just going to go into the pipe. It won't. It won't find its way down into any combustible. It's just going to stay in the pipe. Mm -hmm. metal. Yeah. Okay. If it finds a combustible, it'll start to burn it. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. Then I'll just con I'll just continue with with my part. Okay. Um, you're welcome to stay, and uh, if you get a call or if you have. Okay things that you need to do. No I totally understand. I'd okay. just like to take advantage right. of having you here. Um, okay, so the Ready, Set, Go program really just focuses on those three elements. Get ready, get set, and go when evacuations are ordered. Um, and the key in, in the go part is to go early. And a lot of times we get, uh, you know, I, I field a lot of complaints about why, why do we have to evacuate so early? Why are they telling us to leave so early? And <laughs> generally, the reason is because we need, you know, law enforcement carries out those evacuation orders. They're the ones who go in and they evacuate neighborhoods. They don't have protective clothing. So we need to make sure that they're in there when it is safe for them to be in there. Because if the firefighters are going in there to do it, we call it a rescue, not an evacuation. Um, so we have to send them in early enough that it's safe for them to be there. And we're hoping that we get enough people to leave so that the roads are clear for our equipment to come in and do what they need to do. So the more people that abide by those evacuation orders, the better off everybody is because the fire department can move around freely and they can go from home to home and do their structure protection or do whatever it is they need to do. 
Um, it's very important, and I know there's a lot of areas where there's only one way in, one way out. You're kind of limited in your access routes, but it's really important for you to know every way that you have to get out of the area. And another question that I get asked a lot is, well, which way do I go? Which way do, we, do I evacuate? And it's really difficult for um, fire department or law enforcement or anybody to, to answer that question before there is a fire because we don't know until there is a fire which way you're going to need to go, right? That makes sense. So <clears throat> I would just encourage everybody to be prepared early, leave early, and get out of the area. Um, I had a chief once explain it, you know, when people would say, but I need to know where to go. You know, I need to know which way to go. And he, the way he explained it, um, which was which was very um, cute, was, uh, have you ever sat around a campfire? And you're sitting around the campfire, and then the smoke starts to blow in your face. What do you do? You get up and you move to the other side, right? You just, you go the other way, basically, is what, is what his message was. Just whatever way the fire's coming, you go the other way. And, uh, and, and that's probably the easiest way for you to think about it. Now, where are you going to go? That's another question. We aren't going to have shelters set up immediately. A lot of people don't need those shelters, but we do set them up in case you do need them. And they are a good place to go once they are set up, if for no other reason than to get information, because we do provide um, the Red Cross volunteers there with updated information. So it is a good source of information as to what is going on, when we plan to lift evacuations, when we plan to open roads, anything like that. Um, until those shelters are set up, then our recommendation is you just go anywhere that's away from the fire. You go to a friend's house, you go to a shopping center, go, go to a movie. You know, just go somewhere until we have had time to set up that shelter, and then the media will let you know where those shelters are set up. Um, when you do leave your home, uh, there are certain things that you can do inside your house to also help things, and that would be to close every door inside your house. Because if for some reason fire did intrude and did get into your home, it could possibly be isolated to just one part of your home. And those doors being closed would delay the fire from getting to another part of your home. Uh, so that is something very important. If you have drapes, open them up to expose the window because that radiant heat will go through and, and then the drapes could, they, they become a combustible and they could catch fire from that radiant heat. So we, you know, you can tear them down if you have time, but at least open them up completely. If you have plastic blinds, open those up as well. Um, if you have fire-resistant coverings, fire-resistant shutters or fire-resistant blinds, you can keep those closed, and that will help. Um, so there are a number of different things that you can do. Leave, leave the lights on in your house, uh, especially if your house is a little bit more remotely located, possibly, because even at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if there's a lot of smoke in the area, it might as well be the middle of the night. You know, things are not very visible. So if lights are on, it's good identification that there is a structure there. So as long as the power stays on, the lights will be on and your home will be visible. Uh, so those are some things that you can do. When you are leaving, the other thing that we, we strongly recommend that you do is, and this is what you want to do on a good day. You want to take a look at your house and take a look at your belongings, and you want to think to yourself, what is absolutely irreplaceable? What would I need to take with me when I go? And make a list. And not just a list of what items those are, but what room in the house are they located in? So, Because when the sheriff is knocking on your door and they're saying you have 10 minutes to get out, your mind just goes to mush, right? You start to panic. Um, and that's not the time to start thinking about what am I going to take with me? Because when you're panicking, you can't think about what am I going to take with me. You just grab your, you grab everybody in your family, you grab your pets, and you just leave. But if you have some sort of a list that you can go by, and you can go room by room and grab those things that are irreplaceable, pack them up, throw them in the car, and then go. So that's another thing that we recommend. And 
you know, on top of that, I would take, I would prioritize some of those things. If I only had 10 minutes to get out of this house, what am I taking with me? If they told me I had 30 minutes to get out, now the list can be a little bit longer. What more can I take with me? And then you're only limited by the, the space in your car or cars, right? Don't forget your pets. Please take your pets with you. Have a little go bag. Just make sure you have food and water and, and anything else you might need for you know at least a few hours uh, to get by. Um, and then you know again you just you just want to pay attention to the media. Follow um, in the city of Santa Clarita. Their website is excellent during emergencies. They are right on top of things. I am in constant contact with the city. I am all I am constantly feeding them information about the conditions. Uh, road closures, evacuation areas, um, and any any information about the fire that we can pass on to the public, they will put on their emergency page on their website. So that, that would be a very good place for you to look uh, to see what is going on and what you need to know. Um, for the fire department, the other thing that you need to know, um, how many of you are familiar with red flag warnings? You all know what those are? Okay. So the red flag warning is um, very high fire danger. Um, it is what happens when, and there's two things that absolutely need to be present in order for a red flag warning to be in effect. And that is winds are in excess of 25 miles per hour and humidity is less than 15%. And a red flag warning does not mean that a fire is going to start. What it means is that if a fire does start under those conditions, it could rage out of control at a much faster rate than firefighters can get their hands on it. Uh, so that is why red flag warnings are, we take them very seriously in our department. And when we do have that, and even sometimes short of a red flag warning, when we have extreme fire conditions, we are very proactive in the county fire department and we augment our staffing. So we will put extra firefighters at stations. We will staff our patrols. Uh, we will bring in a strike team, which is five extra engines and another battalion chief. Uh, so we have all this extra equipment already in the area should something occur. And then we don't have to necessarily wait for those units to come in. So we'll still dispatch additional units, but we have so much more available to us immediately under those conditions. So it's important for you and the community to know that we do that. We are constantly monitoring the weather and we will augment our staffing when that's necessary. <clears throat> are there any questions yet? Anything specific that somebody would like me to cover? Hmm? Cameras? Do we have cameras? No, we don't have cameras. No, we do not have cameras. Um, do you mean set up like strate in strategic locations? No. You know, Orange County is testing that. Um, not so much in populated areas, but in, in their forest areas. Um, they're, they're just, they've just started testing that. Um, inside this booklet, um, it is, we do call it your personal wildfire um, action plan. And I also did give you the one sheet, so if the booklet is too much for you to read, uh, everything is highlighted on this one sheet. So it's got the most important tips on there. Uh, but it, there, there are some pages here that are basically fill in the blanks. Um, and you create, there's a lot of different checklists on how to prepare your family, how to prepare your, your uh, disaster plan, um, having fire extinguishers. How many of you have fire extinguishers at home just for everyday use? Good, good. Everybody should. Everybody should. Some of the most common fires uh, that firefighters go on are cooking fires and candles and space heaters. Um, you know, things like that. So it's, it's everybody should have fire extinguishers. So there's different checklists of what to do if the fire is approaching. Um, there's indoor checklists, there's outdoor checklists, uh, there's some survival trips if you happen to get trapped uh, in the fire. Um, and then there's, there's just a very, very um, concise, we call it the six P's of things to always be thinking about. And that is people and pets, 
always make sure everybody is accounted for and that you plan for everybody. Have your important papers and phone numbers, uh, important documents, insurance documents, all of that. Um, prescriptions, make sure you take medications with you if you're going to evacuate because you don't know how long you're going to be out. And we do try our very hardest to get people back into their homes as quickly as we can. Um, but we, you know, sometimes it's just very difficult. And if we keep you out of your home for a few days, um, we're not trying to be mean. We're just trying to make sure that it is absolutely safe for you to return and that most of our equipment has left. Uh, because that can become dangerous for you to be maneuvering around all of our equipment as well. Uh, pictures and irreplaceable memorabilia. I talked about those things that are just irreplaceable. Uh, personal computers. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to take the whole computer out, but if you know how to just grab the hard drive out of the computer, that's very valuable uh, to be able to have that. Um, a lot of people, what they will also do is, is periodically make copies, uh, you know, back up what's on their computers and just go put it in a safety deposit box or keep it at work or, you know, keep it somewhere else, especially your photos. If you have your photos on your computer, you might want to have backup copies of some of those digital photos on a, on a DVD or something that you keep somewhere else so that you don't lose any, any photos. And then uh, cash, plastic, we call that last P, plastic. Uh, credit cards, ATM cards, and cash. Always have cash. Cash should be a part of any disaster supply kit that you might have. Do you all have disaster supply kits made up at home? Because we learned that for earthquakes, right? Well, they work for fires too. They work for any disaster that we could possibly be faced with. If you don't, for those of you who have a disaster supply kit, do you maintain it? Or did you build it after the 94 earthquake and it's still just sitting there? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that stuff goes bad. You know, <laughs> the food goes bad. The water goes bad. <laughs> so you got to, you know, it's one thing to, to make that disaster supply kit. Now you have to maintain it because those things have expiration dates. So you want to make sure that you have your food, your water, a flashlight, radio, batteries. Um, be smart and get solar powered or crank radio and, and flashlight. You don't have to worry about batteries corroding or... Um, anything like that. Uh, you want to have cash in a disaster supply kit, and you, but it's not that $100 bill. Don't, don't put that $100 bill in your disaster supply kit, um, because especially after an earthquake, because there isn't going to be an electricity anywhere, and nobody's going to be able to make change for you. So small denominations. Uh, keep some 20s, 10s, 5s, singles, um, you know, and keep, keep some money. Uh, stashed away in your kit and your medications. First aid kit, um, if you have kids, grandkids, activities for them, keep them busy. Um, and then, but water, food and water and your flashlight and your radio, those are the most important things for you to have. And if you don't have a radio, I always remind people, if you have a car, you have a radio. Okay, because a lot of people will say, I don't have a portable radio. Well, you do. It's on wheels. So, any questions? Yes. Douglas Frazier. In, in gated communities and communities that aren't public streets, how do you know where the fire lane is and, and how people park and how long they can park next to the house versus coming in and, and ticketing them or, or making sure it's clear. Captain Rossi, you want to take that one? Like a mobile home community where it's not a public road, but it's a community. Some of those roads aren't even 26 feet wide. Correct. They're yeah. grandfathered in from long ago. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, if, if some of the managers aren't enforcing the rules, then how would a resident come to you or go to the manager, write a complaint? Thank you. Anybody else? 